All right, so uh, we're doing this series um, called I Connect. You know, it's kind of funny. I came up with this title at the end of the series. I should have done it at the start. You know, we live in this world of iPhone, iPads, and everything, but it's all made us so disconnected from one another and one with God. So it's really awesome for us to get back and see how we can all learn to connect with God and how best and cool to learn this from none other than Jesus himself, who teaches us how we can connect. But why, why would we want to do that? Isn't the world awesome? Isn't life going great? You know, just yesterday, I think um, the stock market ended on with an all-time high, you know, the Dow Jones. And they said, wow, it can't get better than this. And it looks like technology is booming, jobs market is thriving, home prices are going up. But amidst all of these fantastic things that are happening around us, we also keep hearing these blips of news that comes every now and then that show and reveal to us how some big leaders are falling. You know, we've heard about in the last few years, as much as this financial growth happened, there was also big financial disasters with some huge leaders who were leading financial firms uh, fell with moral failure. Political leaders have been caught um, with moral failures. You know, sports personalities, you know, who are supposed to be a sign and a symbol and an inspiration for success have been caught failing. Just last week, they found that the one who ran the Chicago Marathon and came first is involved in a doping scandal. I mean, things like this look really sad, you know. And it's not just the world of finance or politics or sports, even religious leaders. You know, recently there's this huge church pastor who had to step down because of some um, personal issues. So all this kind of reveals to us that something is fundamentally wrong in the world's understanding of leadership. You know, we all look up to leaders, we all want to be leaders, but it seems to be leadership at any cost because at the heart, there appears to be a vacuum. And God wants you and me to be raised as leaders who are not only competent in what we do, but are also solid in our character. But that's exactly where we see all these big guys falling. Well, statistically, they say two out of three leaders do not finish well. And they fall for reasons ranging from uh, financial irregularities, to sexual immorality, to pride, and a few more. So they say it's not how you begin that matters, it's how you end. And then you have the statistic that two out of three leaders don't finish well. Oh, it's, it's not just for people at the top who are leading big organizations, isn't it? It's even for us. We, I mean, we are constantly surrounded by things that can tempt us and drag us on all sides. And specifically, if you look at it, it's kind of, it boils down to the realm of three big things. It's either money, or power, or sex. That's it. And living in the West, we may not worship any big idols, but these are some hidden idols that we all are kind of entangled with, and that can actually pull us away and make us fall. Well, how do we know that we have these idols? I mean, just look at the ads around us. I mean, if you sit and watch any TV commercials or the banners, what do they appeal to? You know, you will have an ad that's talking about a car and a beautiful girl standing next to it. What is this? You know, uh, the expression of beauty in a scantily dressed woman have to do with this fast going car? They're always trying to appeal to these three basic senses to draw us away and look at the movies or, you know, all of these things are putting us in situations that can tempt us and drag us, whether it's jobs that promise promises more money or positions that promises more power or relationships that are always giving you a false idea that this relationship will be better than what you have right now. So if this is not, you know, if we are not kind of going to give in to any of these so-called temptations around us, 
And if we somehow survive, life isn't all that sweet too, isn't it? Life throws its own sets of curved balls at us. People who survive this go through really, really difficult times because there is just so much evil out there in the world. You know, we are constantly impacted by evil. I mean, uh, uh, at a macro level, you know, there is evil in the world. Maybe we are, we are insulated from it right here in the Bay Area, from sexual slavery to, um, you know, uh, people who are being killed in other parts of the world, entire groups of people belonging to a particular tribe. If you read the no news, it's so sad. But we may not have gone through all of these at a big level, but we all go through this acts of evil of somebody else, you know, maybe even in our workplaces, right? Things that are happening to us are not fair. We work hard, you really work hard, and someone else takes the credit for it. Or if something goes wrong, you are pinned for everything that went wrong. Or if you do well, people are jealous and they are trying to get rid of you. So, and, and it, it's not just outside, even inside our own homes, because of this sense of evil that can be even in our own hearts sometimes, you know, between husbands and wives, or between parents and children. So how do we do this? When life gets tough, what do we do? You know, um, I don't know how many of you know of Robert Schuller. Um, he's a very inspirational uh, speech writer and a author, and he came up with a book a few years ago called Tough Times Never Last, But Tough People Do. Anyone heard of that book? It's so like hot cakes, you know. Tough times never last, but tough people do. So, and his message was all about, he's going to show you how to build a positive self-image no matter what your problem. He even had 10 commandments of possibility thinking. Think about that. But guess what? All this wishful thinking, pop psychology can only get you up for the moment, but it really blows you off. They don't really help us to move beyond this. So, so how do I live my life? You know, on the one side are all these temptations related to money, power, and sex. Then on the other side are all these crises that I have to face because of evil, either in the people around me or even in my own heart. And I'm sandwiched between these two things. How can I just live my daily life? I, want to, I just want to be a normal person. How many of us have felt that way, right? It's just this daily struggle. And so where do we go to? Where do we look to, to really help us? And this is where I think Jesus kind of comes into the scene and he says, he recognizes this is something that's very, very important for us. And so he, he's, he wants to help us and says, I'm going to teach you how to pray and ask God to help you. You know, it's as simple as that. So, and that's why we've come to this Lord's Prayer as uh, he was talking about. Um, it's beautifully divided. You know, it's, um, they say it's... Um, the most spoken words from the Bible by people of all times. 70, less than 75 words. It captures everything that we want to do. So it begins with helping us to look at God as our Father. And then it helps us to start by thinking about this Father, falling in love with Him, what He wants, His kingdom, His will to happen in our lives. Divine please. And knowing that, you know, he's going to take care of us. And then it moves to talk about, Jesus says, oh, you actually do matter. You know, once you're in the Father's business, ask him, yes, ask him that, you know, first for our material needs, we need food. Then for our spiritual needs, because we all uh, uh, have sin and we need his forgiveness and we ought to forgive others. And then finally, he comes to the most important part, that is the deepest part of ourselves, our soul, our very being. He says he wants us to pray for God to help us there. And which is that we don't want to either be led into these temptations or trials that take us down, or we don't want to face these um, evils that are happening in us, around us, that can pull us down. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's a very simple prayer, but he kind of captures it all. So what does this have uh, in, in prayer? You know, there are actually um, two actions 
and two targets in this last line of the Lord's Prayer. The first action, it says is, do not lead us. Lead us not into, what was that? Temptation or trials. So there is an action, he says, don't lead us towards that. And then he says, but deliver us from evil. So there are two opposite things that God is asking us to pray for. He says, God, don't lead us into temptation. But also there is this evil, help that evil not to get to us, deliver us from that. Now it sounds very simple, but it's a little complicated, and I'll tell you why exactly. You know, let's take the first action and the first target. Now at first sight, it looks like Jesus is telling, okay, you guys should pray to God so that he doesn't lead us into temptations because we all know we are not superhuman. You know, if, uh, uh, if there is just anything that's tempting environment, we will give in. How do we know? Well, if you take a three-year-old and put a candy on the table and tell the three-year-old, do not take it. Do you think it works? I've never seen a kid that has so immediately obliged and said, yes, mommy, yes, daddy, I won't take it. <laughs> you can try. Good luck with that. If you have some kids like that, please see me after church. I need your autograph. But it's, it's so tough when we are put in this environment where there are all these temptations to just not give in is so tough. But it looks like in, in this prayer, he says, it's asking God not to lead us into temptation, but but we know in the Bible there was this guy called Job, and you know, we get the sneak peek of what happens where Satan comes to God, God and says, I want to test this guy. I want to tempt him in every way. And God says, okay, go ahead. Wow. And then there is, why Job? Take Jesus himself. You know, before he starts ministry, God, the Bible says in John 4, 1, the Holy Spirit led him to be tempted in the wilderness by the evil one. So right here at the beginning, we see there are two people whom it looks like God led them to be tempted or tested. Now that's the first problem. Now it only gets more complicated than that. In James 1.13, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. So on the one hand, we see God's letting these two people to be tempted. On the other hand, the Bible says, no, God doesn't tempt anybody. Now it goes even a step more further, James says in verses 2 and 3, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. It's the same word, you know, the Greek word, periasmos, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Well, we have a big problem. First problem is, God is not the one who is leading us to be tempted. That's what it says. Second problem is this. You actually, you know, the word is used both for temptations as well as trials. It says you should be happy when you're going through many trials. So if this is the case, if God is not leading me to be tempted, and if I should be happy when I'm put through trials, why should I pray to God, don't lead me into temptations or trials? Do you guys get that? Does it sound a conflicting thing to me? It's so simple, right? I've said this prayer a thousand times in my life, never thought there is this contradiction inherent in that. So how does God resolve this? In fact, Jesus himself resolves this beautifully, right? Although Jesus was led into temptation and all of that, in Matthew 26, 39, and he's going through this, this deepest trial in his life, and he says, my father... If it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. No one voluntarily walks into a place where we are going to be tested, where we are going to be tested to the ends of our wits. And Jesus himself models that. He says it's okay to ask God. Although God does not tempt us, God does not directly do it. Although he may allow Satan and other people in our lives to test us, it's, it's really so that it, he can bring out something good, but it's still okay to ask God, please don't let me go through that, because we are so fragile. Even Jesus himself was fragile, and also we are not sure if we'll come through it brightly.
But also there is another aspect to it. You know, when uh, Jesus lived, the language he spoke was Aramaic and Hebrew. So they say when, when you hear it in those languages, it's not as though Jesus is saying, God, don't let me be tempted. What he's actually saying is, God, don't let me give in to those temptations. Because we are not going to, if we are not going to be put in those trials, we are not going to be changed to be better people. And God wants us to be like his son Jesus. So what we really want from God is the ability and the strength to walk through this temptation or this trial and to have the strength to come out just like Jesus did. Now this makes sense to me. Now I can go to Jesus and say, God, I don't want this. I know right now my life, I'm going through this very difficult situation in my work, or, or this, these aspects are very tempting to me, you know, whether it's related to money or power or sex or relationships. I just, I just can't in my own strength, God, I need your help. And it's perfectly okay to pray that because Jesus understands that. And, 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 and really, so if God is not tempting us, how exactly does this temptation work? You know, so James 1, again, beautifully says 14 and 15, each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. You know, it's, uh, it's good to do a self-diagnosis. They say four uh, warned is forearmed. Th there is a kind of a cycle, whatever the temptation is, uh, that plays its part in our lives. How do we get into temptation? Whatever it may be, whether it's related to money or power or sex. Three things. There's just three ways we do this. One is remembering. Second is imagining. And third is scheming. Let's see if you're awake. Say with me. What's the first one? Remembering. Second one? Okay, I lost you right there. <laughs> Second one is imagining. And third one is scheming. Now let's, let's unpack that. Well, how do we really um, get sucked into temptation by remembering? Well, it can be something, when it, whether it's related to, um, you know, someone hurting us in the past by their hurtful words or statements. Our sinful mind wants to play that back again and again and again so that when it's played back, what kind of emotions does it bring in us? Love for that person? Anger, hatred, bitterness. So you see, you start spiraling down that cycle. And the more often you keep remembering that thing, the more horrible you end up as a person. Or it can be about a, 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 a immoral thought that you had or, or not a very appropriate image that flashed your eyes through the screen of the internet or a magazine or a movie or whatever it may be. The tendency is to want to go back and keep remembering that, right? And then always it ends us putting us in a very, very bad situation. Now, second thing is imagining. This is fantasy, right? Again, let's go back to the same two scenarios. Someone says something that you don't like. You were not ready for it. You got hit very suddenly. And now you are imagining a situation, what you're going to say when you meet them next time. When I meet this person next time, I'm going to give it to him or her, straight in her or his face. And they are going to remember this. This is what you got. See? Or you, you keep imagining about relationships. You know, oh, I think maybe this relationship looks really attractive. This person looks very attractive. And you start dreaming about virtual situations. But you see, where does that end you up again? It, it's again a downward spiral, which means you're already getting sucked into it and you're ending up. And the last is scheming, where you now selectively plan of how so far all these things you were thinking about, you're going to actually make it into action. I'm going to call this guy right now and I'm going to tell him this and this and this. 
Or I'm going to find ways where I can find this emotional relationship with this person which I'm actually supposed to only find in my own spouse. So you see, these are like three ways in which the pathways that can take us where a test can become a temptation and then you get sucked into it and you're hitting at the end. And none of us are free from this. No one can say, oh, I'm, I don't get tempted. Is there anyone here, by the way, who says, never had temptations in my life? <laughs> then you must be Jesus who's come back again. Right. So how do I overcome this temptation then? Man, this is so hard. Well, the only way you can overcome to temptation is not by your own strength. You know, the Bible says, make every thought captive to the thought of Christ because Jesus is the only one who was able to overcome all temptations. You know, he was at his weakest and he was hit by the hardest of temptations by Satan. He gave him power. You know, he gave him uh, wealth. He gave him everything. And Jesus was the one who was able to come through. And there is this beautiful promise the Bible has in 1 Corinthians 10. It says, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. So if we really want to be helped by not getting sucked into temptation, only someone who has actually gone through that can help us. I can't help you. I can preach a sermon, but I can't help you. But the one who can really do is this Jesus. You know, he went through this, and he overcame this in his life, and he realized that we are also going to go through this, and so he had to give us a provision, which is why he went and died on the cross and overcame the very root cause of all of this, which is sin, and he rose again. And so it's only when we are now connected with this Jesus, this Christ who is resurrected, that we can actually have the strength to go through this because he will walk with us and his life that is lived through us will enable us to overcome this. And the Bible even gives us an armor. You know, he says, how do you be ready for this? In, in Ephesians 6, he says, wear the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, use the sword of the Spirit. And if you look at all these armors, it is, all has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with Jesus. It has everything to do with what Jesus accomplished on the cross and how real that is in our lives. So if I am not able to f overcome these temptations, if I'm not able to face these trials and come shining through, I need to ask myself, do I have this Jesus in my life? Because he alone is the one who can empower us. His cross, his power that he conquered on the cross, the sin that was decimated, when he lives in us and abides in us is when we can live this victorious Christian living. So Jesus not only is teaching us to pray and ask for it, he is actually even now, right this very moment, praying for us in the right hand of God as our high priest. And as I sat, prayed this morning, it is his prayer, his intercession constantly, all the time on your behalf and my behalf that is keeping us from already falling away. I don't have anything good about myself to be Mr. Clean, to be bragging about. I can fall just as much as anybody else can fall and the fact that I am not is only because of the grace of God and the mercy of God and Jesus Christ who is constantly interceding on my behalf before God's presence. So there's no one who can boast and say, I'm more religious than you. Oh, I'm more spiritual than you. You know, I don't fall. Look at that guy. And therefore, when someone falls, you don't point fingers at that person and start feeling happy about them. But you actually empathize for them. And you pray for them. That this Jesus who is helping you, both internally by living in you and enabling you and walking with you through this trial, as well as interceding for you, will also do the same for this other person. So it's again not to end up coming with a list of do's and don'ts. Okay, let me do this. Let me just pray the Lord's Prayer and then I will not fall. No, it's not, the, it's not a mantra. You know, it, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's Jesus. The second action in the target 
You know, it comes from the same plea. It's deliver us from evil. The evil within us with which we hurt others. The evil outside of us through which we get hurt. And we, we really live in a fallen world because the whole world is distorted by sin and evil. You know, that's why we have disease, we have famine, we have war. You know, if someone goes through sickness in our home and we are living through that, we understand what this is. We feel helpless we need in those situations. So when it comes to trials and temptations, we pray, then ask God, don't lead us into a situation where we will collapse, but just give us the strength not to yield to it. But when it comes to evil, we don't want to go into it and fight. The prayer is, God, I want you to redeem me from that. Deliver me from that. I don't even want to go near that because we are powerless. And here again, who can help? Only someone who has gone through this in their lives. And who went through evil the most in their lives? You think, well, you have no idea how hard my life is. You have no idea how lonely my life feels. I feel so unloved. I feel so unaccepted. Everyone is about to try to get me. But you know who went through the most evil? The greatest evil of all time happened to none other than Jesus Christ on the cross. Because on the cross, he stared at the sin of the entire world that was put upon him, that disrupted his intimate relationship with his own father who sent him. You want to know loneliness? Jesus understands it. You want to know who suffered? Jesus suffered because he suffered the most. And therefore, it's only this Jesus who can actually deliver us from evil that we went through. And somehow, we, in a, even in a very faint sense, there's a guy called Joseph in the Old Testament who gets it, who lived on the other side of the cross, who didn't even get to see the full Jesus. And even with that faint glimpse of the power of Christ, Joseph was able to tell his very own brothers who actually tried to kill him, what you meant for evil, God intended it for good. And if we are living on this side of the cross, and if this Jesus is so real for you and me, and if he is in our hearts, how much more naturally and easily this should happen to us? Because this Jesus... He does not promise that there will be no trials. He does not promise that there will be no evil. He says, in this world there will be trials. But lose not heart. I am with you all the time is what he told his disciples. But unless we have this relationship with him, this loving relationship with this Jesus, this, is, this prayer is just going to be an you know, empty word. It has no impact. You can say it a thousand times, it won't do anything for you. And we, we, we can say this because we will know just like Jesus did. I don't want to go through this, God. But I know when you are with me and I go through this, I'll come out purified as gold. You're going to use all these things in my life to shape me, to mold me, to replicate you in my own life. And that is what this prayer is all about. And now you can be someone who is changed from the inside out because this Jesus lives in our hearts. And Jesus not only taught us to pray like this, He's actually praying, as I said right now. And he's not only, he's actually praying, he has given us his Holy Spirit who is now going to help us to pray because we just don't know how to pray. And so as we are united with this Jesus and his Holy Spirit and as he burdens our heart to prayer and we pour our heart, there's something mystical and magical that happens in this mysterious union with Christ that gets strengthened and established, which can't be explained but can only be experienced. And the world needs leaders like that, who are not only just competent, who can go get stuff done, but who are also solid in their character, because not that they are better people, because they have this Jesus in their heart and in their lives, who is empowering them, whose life is just flowing out of them, naturally, effortlessly, without wanting to do it.
Those are the kind of leaders and disciples that Jesus wants to create in his kingdom. Well, it's easy for me to say this, and you may ask, it's easy for someone to do it. But what about someone who actually goes through this? You know, that's why I want to point you to this guy. I don't know if you've heard about him. Nick Wujisik. I think that's how we call him. Nick Wujisik. I call him just Nick because I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name right. He has no hands and legs. How much more difficult can life get without that? How many of you have seen this guy or heard his videos? Yeah, quite a few of you, right? So when this guy talks, that's real. Because he's not someone who's telling you theory. I mean, he's lived his whole life without, he was born without hands and legs. You know, they, they tried to do some sonograms and stuff, they couldn't catch it, and so he was just born. His early days were very difficult. His childhood was extremely painful. You know, he not only dealt with um, typical challenges of um, school and adolescence, but he went through depression and loneliness when he was young. He's trying to figure out, why, why me? Why God did this to me? He even questioned the purpose of life. And he thought, I have no purpose, maybe. But something happened to Nick. You know, he's from Australia, and now he lives in Southern California. Is when he found God. When he found this Jesus. Something changed in his life. And now Nick, this is what Nick says. If God can use a man without arms and legs to be his hands and feet, then he will certainly use any willing heart. Wow, that's powerful, isn't it? Because he goes around the world giving hope to people in desperate situations. Because he's found that hope in this Jesus Christ. And he says, if just one more person finds eternal life in Jesus Christ, it is all worth it. It is all worth it. Because he found this higher purpose, this higher calling. That even through all of this, he's somehow able to draw a sense of encouragement. He's able to draw a sense of appreciation. You don't go, someone, I, I don't know what I'd be doing. I'll be starting on a mass, probably, anti-God campaign, probably, right? Why, why does God do this stuff? But you see, he's a living proof to show, even in the worst aspects and trials of life, God is going to be with you. And this Jesus will become real in your life, and he can make something good come out of that. We all have hands and feet. Much, much more blessed than him that we can't complain about. But we all need this relationship with this Jesus in our lives so that he can walk with us. When we walk through either difficult situations in life or when we are tempted by all these things about money and power and sex, we all have our weak spots. We, we, we all can crack at some point. And we are afraid to do that. So Jesus saves the best for the last in his prayer. And he says, just ask God. Because not only have I, am I going to pray for you on your behalf and you pray, I've actually gone ahead and done what is needed to make this a reality in your lives. And, I ho and, and then he summarizes this whole prayer by once again saying, you know, for thine is the kingdom and the glory and power forever to remind us once more our life is not about building our kingdom. Our life is not about doing our glory. Our life is not about craving for more power. Our life is fully lived when it's lived for God, for his kingdom, for his glory, and experiencing his power through his son Jesus who gave himself up for us on the cross. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for these beautiful words that you taught us while you're here on earth on just how to ask and pray to you. All of us here, we need every single word of that prayer in a very real way in our lives, God. Because left to ourselves, We'll run about living lives for our sake, building our own kingdoms, doing things that we like, not being able to forgive those who forgive us, and always wanting to make more money so we can feed ourselves and not worry about those who don't have food, and not having the strength to walk through difficult times in our lives and either give in or give up. 
So we thank you that you've encouraged us to just ask you. So you are a father who loves us and who wants to meet all our needs and you will do all these for us through your son Jesus. As he lives in us, as his spirit lives in us and empowers us. And, and if any of us are here this morning and if we look, take a look into our lives and our hearts, and if all the thoughts of our minds were to flash on a screen right before us, would that make us shameful or happy? And if that reveals those areas that we are struggling in, whatever may be those areas in our lives this morning, maybe we've tried so hard to overcome that, but we recognize that you hit the end of the road and you need a higher power, someone other than you to help you in this. Look at Jesus who he was and what he did on the cross in giving his life as an atonement for you and for me. And he conquered sin, he conquered death, he's resurrected and he's sitting at the right hand of God praying for you and me right now, right this very moment. And let's take this moment to strengthen that relationship. If we don't have that relationship, I invite you to get into this relationship and seek this Jesus and to have him in your hearts, even as we are going to go about and participating in the Lord's communion. You know, the bread and the wine that's placed behind us as symbols of his broken body and the blood he shed to cleanse us of our sins so we can have this amazing new relationship with which through him we can pray this prayer every day to our Abba Father who hears and who will answer us. So I, I want to invite the worship team to come and lead us in the song as we can all go to the back and as God leads, spend some time in silence and prayerfully connecting with God and participating in the Lord's Supper and asking God even as we do that to make all these a reality in our own lives. In Jesus' name I pray.